Joining us now on the phone line where we interview people, it is Mark Mix of the National Right to Work Foundation to discuss uh, what happened here in Vance not long ago as the UAW attempted to unionize our Mercedes plant. And boy, they spent an awful lot of money on ads to get that done and then lost miserably 56 to 44 percent when it came down to the vote. Now, not unpredictably, the UAW is claiming that there was shenanigans. That's right. They're saying shenanigans took place and they would like a revote. Surprised by this at all, Mr. Mix, and thank you for the program. Uh, thank you for joining the program, by the way. Uh, not at all, Richard. Uh, you know, there are election deniers, and uh, we know how people feel about election deniers these days. <laughs> they shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be honored in any way, shape, or form. But this is actually pretty standard operation by the unions. And what happened here is the United Auto Workers Union set out to unionize automotive plants in the right-to-work states like Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee, the places where automotive manufacturing has taken off over the last decade and a half. And so they can't maintain themselves and their support unless they start unionizing Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, Mitsubishi, uh, all these other companies. But in this case, they went out and they started getting signed cards. And it's interesting that the, the standard operating procedure here is to file unfair labor practice charges before the election because under this new Biden administration, they can actually get the National Labor Relations Board, which is the agency that manages these elections, to actually impose unionization on these workers even though they voted against the UAW. And that's exactly what's happening here at Vance right now. It's a little frightening and disturbing, is it not? Now, they, we recently went through this with our Amazon distribution site that is in Bessemer, where uh, right. they had a big union vote, and almost immediately the uh, union said, oh, no, 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 that's null and void because uh, they were cheating. They had a, a drop box on property, and they were keeping a watch on who was voting and whatnot, which, of course, was ridiculous. And then they had a second vote, and the union lost that one too. And they said, oh, no, this is, once again, this is completely unfair. You're just like, you guys are just going to keep complaining until you win, right? That's the way it works for the most part. Yeah, that's right. You know, we actually had a case over in Hamilton, northwest of Birmingham, at a plant over there called NTN Bauer, where there was actually five elections during a decertification process. And, Richard, this is a little bit different, where the union was in and the workers decided that they weren't being represented properly, so they tried to get out. And literally, there were five elections. The first election, the employees won. The UAW objects. The NLRB has a rerun election. The union loses again. They have a rerun election. On the third election, now get this, the union does win, but there were more votes cast than there were eligible voters. So the NLRB had to throw that one out. Election number four, the employees win. The union objects. They, a rerun election comes up. In the meantime, the union tried to impose a contract on the, on the workers so that they could get what was called a contract bar that would stop any elections for at least 12 months. They went to the fifth election, and finally the union walked away after they'd been beaten soundly by the workers there, but literally five elections. So that's the course of action that probably will take place here at Mercedes, and it's not a surprise. But unfortunately, there's been a new rule in place back in August of last year that said that the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, can impose a bargaining order even though workers voted against the union if they adjudicate that there was as you say shenanigans whatever that is and uh, it's really kind of undefined yeah that is the problem isn't it well if you imagine if real life worked this way like i didn't get the outcome i liked and so i'm going to do it again and again and again and just keep going costing all the time and money resources until i get the outcome i like or someone tells me i can't do it anymore olympic races we're going to just rerun that race until the guy who wants to win wins. Yes. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, April. Yeah, that's spot on, April. And, you know, as I said, it used to be that they had to rerun the elections. That was the ordinary remedy for any kind of adjudication of an unfair labor practice charge or anything that the employer might have done that would have, quote, unquote, violated the laboratory conditions necessary for an election. But now they don't even need a rerun. That's the, that's the difference here at Mercedes. It literally, in a month or two, this decision, this complaint by the union will go to the, what's it, the regional director over in Atlanta, and that regional director will decide whether or not the, the charge has merit they will issue a complaint and then there'll be a hearing and then an administrative law judge could say oh you know what despite the election results despite the will of the people in this in this election we are going to re we're, we're not even going to rerun the election we're just going to give the union control over all the workers and force the company to negotiate with them that's what could, what could happen possibly here. go wrong um it seems to me <laughs> that the nlrb does sort of change opinions with each president because they get to kind of rearrange the seating on it right because I don't recall this sort of thing happening under the Trump presidency. 
Uh, we know that Joe Biden is very union friendly. He's, you know, lunch pail Joe, even though the man never actually worked a day in his life. So I, I have to look at it and say, if Donald Trump were to win the upcoming election, uh, replace a couple of board members on the NLRB, it seems to me that, you know, when an election takes place and the union loses, the NLRB would look at the union and go, you lost, go sit down somewhere. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> Yeah, the interesting part about that, Richard, and, and while the Biden administration actually exercised that prerogative within about 30 seconds of Joe Biden being sworn in, they sent an email over to the general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. That's the top lawyer there that kind of runs the legal program for the NLRB. And they said, if you don't resign by 5 o'clock today, which was Inauguration Day, um, you would be fired. And uh, so the, pers- the, the general counsel at the time said, no, I don't want to resign, so they fired him. The acting general counsel came in, who was his number two. That next morning, she got an email saying, if you don't resign by 5 o'clock, you'll be fired. And then they finally got their person in position, who's a former union lawyer, that runs the operation, that controls all of this. So you're right, Richard. That's a real problem, that kind of instability, if you will, of this tennis match where you have policies that change perhaps every four years. But yes, uh, by, uh, Trump could do that. These board members, there are five of them, they serve five-year terms, so one of them comes off every year. And there is a reset, there's an, a vacancy right now. So this next election could basically determine the majority on that board going forward for the next four years. Well, the whole thing is very frightening. You you paint a fairly bleak picture here, I must admit. I was going to say, uh, Mark, give us some good news. Yeah. <laughs> well, the good news is that the workers at Vance who are objecting to the UAW continuing to push, even though they were voted out, can go to the union and withdraw those cards that the union used to basically trigger the election, and they can get you know information about their rights here at the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. We're representing workers in over 250 active cases right now. We do nothing but represent employees whose rights have been violated by these forced unionism and compulsory unionism arrangements. We've uh, argued 18 cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and we do it all for free. We have 20 lawyers who will do nothing but answer your questions about your rights in the workplace. So we offer that. They can find us at nrtw.org, nrtw.org, and they can get questions answered by folks that know the law and can help them exercise their rights. Good stuff. Mark Mix, National Right to Work Foundation. Thank you very much for spending some time with us and uh, shedding a little light on the issue. We appreciate you, man. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, April. All right. Take care. Mark Mix, National Right to Work Foundation.